I will hand over to Ashley. Thank you for joining us and, and please everybody do enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll kick off. I mean, th this is, you know, who, who is it that you're speaking to? Uh, um, my name, as I mentioned, Ashley Ward. I have the very fancy title of Cloud CTO for Prisma Cloud. That's part of Palo Alto Networks. So this isn't going to be about that product that's, uh, that's there or anything about Palo Alto Networks. Um, they, they're happy enough just to have a little, um, have their brand on the bottom of the slides. There is one slide at the end which is specific because then, of course, the people will pay me, so that's always nice. Um, but who am I, right? So I started out life as a, a Unix admin. Um, I was uh, worked for a utilities company up here in Scotland. I then went on to become an infrastructure architect with, um, with Sky TV, actually. And, and that was where I started coming across the land of, of DevOps. And, uh, and I realized that you know, there was a disconnect between operations and development. I had an operations background. The developers I worked with obviously didn't know anything about computers. Um, but that was just because my viewpoint was skewed because I was operations. And, and the fact is that dev is hard, ops is hard. And so you know, how can we do both in a joined up way? Now, but the actual why around that DevOps enablement, well, it was, uh, I like to put actually achieving things, but really, you know, what my job consisted of as a Unix admin was coming up with reasons to say no to people. So if they came up with some fancy new design or something really cool that was going to make the business lots of money, they'd come to me and I'd say, no, you're trying to run that as root. We don't allow that. Go away. And then they'd come back and they'd say, well, we fixed that. And I'd get to say, well, it's got vulnerabilities. So no, go away. And it, and it was quite, quite a good for a, for a 21 year old lad to be able to have root access and say all these things. But of course it doesn't actually help the business do anything. And then as a designer, it was a similar kind of thing. I was able to um, suck my teeth and say, oh, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to, to handle that level of transactions. That's a lot of storage you're gonna need for that and that kind of thing. So it was actually quite tiring. And actually being part of this DevOps stuff that was happening, I suddenly could see, well, wait a minute, it's not just another server that I'm building, it's actually something that does something for the, for the business. And I found that really exciting. I then went into financial services, and that's where the DevSecOps part comes in. And that's where, as much as I hate DevSecOps, I've come to accept that term. So looking at, looking at DevOps, what's, what's DevOps? Well, Atlassian uh, kindly put this together. So many different people uh, say many different things for DevOps. For my purposes, this is a pretty good, pretty good quote. Now, the key part here is that it's the end of that. It's the build, test, and release software faster and more reliably. It doesn't necessarily mean when we talk about continuous delivery and continuous integration, things like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that all that new stuff is immediately running in prod, but it should be production capable. So on the one hand, there's getting ops out of the way and allowing devs to deliver. This means that software can be delivered faster. The flip of that is, of course, shifting operational responsibility to the developers. And that means that it gets more reliable as they're the ones who are running it. I mentioned that I hated the term DevSecOps. But I have come to appreciate it. And it really is just to emphasize that security now needs to come in. It, it's easy to say, well, security should always have been there. And it probably should have always been there. But it, it's something that wasn't, hasn't been. And so the emphasis now is to say, yes, security is very much part of that. So some of the keys to, to success with, with DevSecOps, they come back to those favorites that we all know and love, people, process, and of course, the, the tools or the technology. Um, but if we're looking at this, um, this, this is really about, you know, why is a, the company or is a business going into DevOps? And if you have an enterprise or an organization that is then also saying, well, we should be doing something with security and thinking about DevSecOps, well, that's where we're then saying, right, okay, who are involved? You know, who are the people that are doing this? Because frankly, we need to talk to them. The, the, the processes that we're going to use, if we're, if we're not thinking about these things up front and just being open and honest about them, now what are the people, what are the processes, and what does the technology look like, then we're probably going to fail. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, a shortly. So my key, my key part, whenever, whenever people start saying, oh, DevSecOps, well, you know, it, it, what's the benefit? And it come to me, it goes back to that same chat about DevOps. Well, why, why are we doing this? Is it just more buzzwords? Are we just trying to, just trying to throw more things in so we all can stay in jobs for a bit longer? Um, and I don't believe that's the case. I, I've, I've certainly been involved in enough projects that were, um, where there was that very big handover. 
there was all this work that would be done in a development area, and then all of a sudden it would appear uh, to go into production. And by that point, it was too late. We were then, if it was a new project, you're then in the situation of saying, well, no, it breaks all these different rules. We've got regulatory commitments. We've got all these security policies for good reason. And of course, that this doesn't follow any of them. And typically then you have a battle between um, operations or, or the, you know, the ongoing stuff and the business who want to actually deliver this stuff. They've spent an awful lot of money developing something and sure want to get their, the benefit of it. So if you have the agreement that, no, we, we appreciate we're moving into a DevOps world because we have seen the benefit or we anticipate to see the benefit or we've seen that the industry has a big benefit there. You need to, you need to rationalize what the whole DevOps thing is about. And so if you're in security, you should think about, well, why is the organization moving that way and what the benefits are? If you're in a DevOps team that's already done that, then is it possible to engage security and explain, well, this is, this is why, the, why we're moving to this DevOps way of working to show the benefits of that and try to engage security. And here are some of the bits. I mean, we, we talked there about, about images, but really that could be anything. You know, you want to gain visibility early on in the process. You want to deploy higher quality code and avoid security incidents, of course. And it really is just a case of, um, if you can think of a, a testing triangle, we can say, well, we can do all this stuff up front and it saves us a lot, a lot of money. Um, even just from a DevOps point of view, uh, the, a story I particularly like, um, I was working with a company and we were delivering, I was, I was part of a DevOps team. Um, I, I was an able, enabler for other DevOps teams actually, but part of the, the scrum of scrums, if you like, we were talking about this upcoming feature. And this upcoming feature, everyone agreed was going to be fantastic. Uh, the, the business loved it, the IT organization loved it. Um, we then put it through tests and it seemed to be going great. And as soon as it came to the end users, uh, there was a resounding no from them for various reasons that we don't need to talk about, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something you would have foreseen. It, only after speaking to the users did it become clear. Now, the good thing was that had been delivered in a very agile way. It was agile using DevOps as well so that everybody could see the end result of that minimum viable product very early on. And it was very easy because it was DevOps. We were very easy to then be able to accommodate change, accept failure and move on. So this is about saying, do we recognize the benefits of doing this? And if so, then what is it for DevSecOps? Now, there, there are lots and lots of different tools. This is us talking about some of that technology. And um, one of the things about DevOps teams is oftentimes they're empowered to be able to use different tooling to perform different things. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a, an industry standard. And when I speak to customers and uh, organizations who are looking to, to move into a DevSecOps model, they tend to find that the security teams uh, can approach this with, with some level of horror, right? So it's, it's kind of always was a joke when as an operations guy approaching this and going, right, let's see this DevOps thing. It seemed we only ran software if it was um, 0.01 release. As soon as it went to 0.2, then it was, wow, that was just far too mainstream for us. And it's easy to make that joke. It's then also easy to see why though, that as security people coming in and looking at, at what's going on, the, the huge rate of change, the agile methodologies where we're not necessarily following this in five years time, this is how the product's going to look, or these are the gates or this kind of thing. And because we're doing things and failing fast, it can be very frightening for security to come in. And, and I'm, I think it's, it'd be very difficult because it, it's very humbling to come in to a, an organization or to anyone who's operating uh, in a DevOps way to then say, right, okay, well, we, each team has different, different build tools that, that fits them. Things are being shipped really regularly. And, and do those make production? Do they just stay in a registry? And then what's going on with runtime? Because typically when you're operating in that DevOps or DevSecOps way, you heard me mention Agile there because typically people are using Agile methodologies with that. And then also people are then moving into, and this is part of a, a survey that Palo Alto has done, Palo Alto Networks has done, that also then shows that people tend to be using cloud native technologies. And so lots and lots of small things that are ephemeral. And so you have this situation where there's lots of build stuff happening, lots of shipping going on, and then the runtime just seems, just seems crazy. So I tend to talk to people who are going into that and thinking about DevOps and DevSecOps and say, right, you know, appreciate the benefits and why the organization is doing this. Then have a look at things and say, right, 
of all the crazy stuff that's happening, what's the expertise that you can bring in? So from a security point of view, it's not that uh, developers and operations didn't want to do a lot of the security. It's a lot of the times it was just too, too hard. It was something that would be either um, unaware of or didn't have visibility into or were unable to automatically do or it was outside of their remit or all these other reasons. They're just barriers to entry to actually do it. And that, that I can, you know, I can even feel myself going, well, they should still have been doing it. It's, it's easy to say that, but this is what we want to change. And that's why I think it's so important that we say DevSecOps, because it's really highlighting that. So we've got that feedback loop. I think any time you mention DevOps, you've got to have this sideways figure of eight. Um, it's a legal requirement. I've got to show it. Look at this loop. Isn't it great? Um, it's, it is something that's probably overused, but it does just show and it really highlights that um, we want that feedback. It needs to be a constant thing so that everybody can see and hear what's going on. Okay, what are the, what are the steps then for going into, uh, from a DevSecOps point of view? Now, I mentioned uh, cloud native. Uh, we, we do generally see, well, I'd say 99% of everything that we do when we speak to DevOps teams and DevSecOps, they are operating in a cloud native way or are looking to go cloud native. Now, I don't necessarily mean public cloud. So if you think of the um, a public cloud or cloud technologies, I like to break down into roughly three, three parts. There's the, the using cloud like uh, infrastructure as a service or, or you know, consuming public cloud provider stuff. There's uh, using SaaS services. So you know, using Gmail or something like this, that would be another type of cloud. And then the third one is, is a cloud mindset and a cloud way of working. And, and you'll hear lots of buzzwords about that, about you know, zero trust and all this kind of good stuff. But if we think about those three things, a cloud native way of working, that last one there, it could use the different aspects we've talked about. It could be using infrastructure as a service, running in AWS. It could be using you know, Gmail as the example I gave. It could be using a different public cloud provider or all of that could be running on premise. And it could be running on premise um, and just being operated in a cloud native way. So think about that. And to do that from a cloud native way, um, I like to talk about containers. Uh, I read some stuff recently on, on Twitter that was saying, why is it that everybody who says cloud native just says containers? It, it's, it, is, it is amusing because that is what everybody says, but it's because it's the easiest one to really talk about. But this is true through, across that cloud native continuum. So if you think you've got on one side, you can talk about uh, having VMs and treating those VMs as uh, cattle instead of pets, and that would be operating in a cloud native way. And there will be workloads that are best suited for running on a VM. And you have the most control and you have all these other things that comes from operating a VM. On the other side of that continuum, you've got the, the serverless functions or functions as a service. Uh, and that will be good for some workloads, but there are plenty of horror stories out there of people who have gone all the way to serverless thinking it's a, a destination or a goal, uh, and, then, and then it's not right for their application. It's, some things are slower, some things are, um, are a lot more costly. And so there's a lot there. And kind of in between those, you've got various different ways of running containers. And so containers to me are the easiest ones to talk of when we speak about cloud native. So from a DevSecOps point of view, we're getting that feedback loop and we want to see things. So know the source and content of what you're pulling in. And here we're talking about images and containers, but this could be where are you pulling that code from? Where does that AMI come from that spins up those VMs? Is it one you've built yourself? Um, who has access to create that? What's the, what's the base that pulls in everything for your, for your workloads? So containers, are you pulling images from a third party? Who builds those images? All of that good stuff. And here we've got a Docker file example. Docker file is a good way of explaining a little bit more about that cloud native and the DevOps way of working. So uh, one of the things that I sometimes get some feedback on are people saying, well, you, you've, you've got to segregate duties. You have a segregation of duties to say that I can't allow my developers access to production. Um, I can't do, I can't give them the rights to be able to go in and fiddle with things that are running there because I've got, I've got security boundaries. Yes, absolutely correct. That doesn't mean you can't do things in this way. And that's where the cloud native stuff really plays into DevSecOps. Here we have a, a, a Docker file. And what happens with a Docker file is it's used to build an image. And that image is then what is used to, to run containers. Containers are based off of images. And so in this way, we can give developers access to write Docker files. We can have something else build those into images. We can have something else deploy those images and run them uh, in production. 
And that's the same for any of these cloud native things. They're declarative, they're very small, and they're ephemeral. So we can, we can change things fast. So in this case, we, we want to know, uh, do we need to rebuild these things? Where are we hosting this? So in this case, we're, we're maybe pulling stuff from, from somebody out in the interweb. So what happens then if this changes? Do we need to care about that? And these are all questions that we can look at if we've got that visibility into the DevSecOps world. The next thing is one that's often overlooked, and that's eradicating vulnerabilities. Um, with, uh, you know, with enablement and uh, empowering developers to do DevOps, well, that means there is that operational burden. So traditionally, you would have perhaps a, an infrastructure team who did all the patching uh, once a quarter or, or once a month if it was a security patches. Well, the great thing is we can now do these a lot faster because we have these declarative ephemeral things that are there, and, but actually the responsibility has shifted. It's now over with the DevOps team. It's over with the person building those images. So those people need to have visibility. Now, this isn't new. I mean, we've got um, Unit 42 or part of Palo Alto Networks who do a lot of a very, very technical threat uh, investigations and stuff like this. Um, I like them because, of course, the 42 comes from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, so always good there. Um, in a recent uh, scan that they've done, they saw that 24% of exposed cloud hosts, so hosts that are out there, we're not talking about fancy containers, uh, have known vulnerabilities on them. Uh, and those are ones that are public or internet facing. So uh, a lot of the times, you know, people say, well, we should have been patching these container thingies early on. I often say, well, I, I know some horror stories about uh, infrastructure running in data centers that have got some, some pretty bad vulnerabilities there. Okay, so know what the, what's inside, get visibility, make it easy for people to fix things. Here we then say, well, do we want this to be running? It's got red in it, that's probably bad, right? Do we want that to be there? Well, probably not, but the whole point of this is it's all about risk assessment. And this needs to then be part of the business conversation that's there. And that's going to be a lot different if you're, I don't know, running a, a nuclear reactor versus if you're um, hosting cat pictures. You know, if I'm maybe hosting cat pictures, I maybe don't mind some of these, um, but I do if it means that my website's going to be hacked. You know? So it, it's all about that risk. With these things, though, you have this visibility and can immediately see everything that's out there. So, hard, uh, pardon me, so do the vulnerability analysis on those cloud native things. Hardening. Hardening is something that I used to get into a lot of conversations with my developers about. We would harden our infrastructure and so that when someone came to try and run something, it was practically useless. And that, of course, was because we had knew all these best practices about what happens if something goes wrong. Whereas if you look at any of the tutorials to get started with things, typically you'll see stuff like oh, just install this, you know, uh, pull this uh, shell script from the internet, pipe it through Bash, and that on your fresh, new, lovely Ubuntu machine will work, will work fine. But of course, we do need to harden things. Um, you know, by default, originally put Docker on a host and gave someone access to Docker, well, they had root access. So would you have given them root access in the first place? Possibly not. These are standard things that then just come with us in that DevSecOps um, whole, whole life cycle of what we're doing. Leveraging CI, CD. So all of this stuff so far, we've still kind of been talking about bringing traditional security into this new way of working and leveraging your CI, CD pipeline tools is possibly where we start looking at things a little bit differently. So instead of having security teams focus solely on production and what's in production, we're now saying, well, we could actually be doing this a lot earlier on. And if we're doing stuff where we know with our cloud native technologies that things are ephemeral then, uh, and declarative, then we can be pretty sure that if it's declarative, we know what's, we know what's in there in CICD. We're still going to look at production because of course we don't trust everything. We're still gonna do all those checks, but we can do these things a lot earlier. And we can actually do things in um, the native tooling that the developers are using. So it's no longer a case of saying, okay, you've built a new service, that's fantastic. If you raise a ticket with the security team, then someone will get around to get running a scan against it. Maybe it will go into CMDB and be picked up in a week. We, we can avoid that. We can do things as soon as they're built. And we can do things, as I mentioned, in the tools that developers are using. And so saying here, you know, you don't need to change the stuff that you're, you're, you're doing. This can just fit in with all those different tools that are there. Then we mentioned segregation. If I've got here Docker environment, this is just because we're talking about it. For it could be any of those cloud native things. Um, who is has access to serverless functions? 
Um, which way, where do you put those? Do you have some in this account? Do you have a production account? Do you have team accounts? There's all that kind of thing. And that goes back to that first part of you need to speak to the people. We, you know, if we're coming from a DevOps background, we need to talk to security and engage with security. And if we're coming from a security background, we need to appreciate that, that DevOps are, are, are operating at very high speed. And so they need that expertise to come in. So what is the role segregation? Who, who, is, uh, who has access to run these things? Is, is my developer running this stuff in prod because they just had to, that's the way it's always been. And should that be the case going forward? Automation, this is something that ties right back in. We've talked about the CICD, we've talked about, you know, all the different ways we can achieve this. But one of the things that will come up when you're discussing about DevOps and becoming DevSecOps is how are you managing to cope with that rate of change, Mr. DevOps person? Well, they're managing that through automation. And, and that's where, as security, people need to come in and say, right, we will, can be part of that automation. Whether that's taking uh, security standards and translating them into actual real world tests, or um, whether that's saying, well, what happens in, in the runtime? So once we've got everything and it's running in production, how can I know all the stuff that's out there? If we've got you know, microservices where we've got thousands of containers that are running and they're coming and going, they don't have a static IP address that I can traditionally scan against, but what does that mean? How do we do that? And that's where the automation comes in. Now, obviously, um, you know, the, the later on slides will be about why Palo Alto Networks is the perfect choice for all of this. But regardless of what, from what a vendor says, what I as a vendor say, this is something that's achievable in this way of working. You, you've already got those feedback loops. We've already seen that sideways figure of eight. This is something that can be incorporated for DevSecOps. Okay, perform regular audits. This is true and has been true since we learned about VM sprawl when we all moved to virtual machines. When we look at things from a DevSecOps point of view, it can be easy. Um, so oftentimes when people move into cloud native ways of working or into DevOps, um, and I, I speak to them, it's because they have had perhaps explorers that are out there to see, is this way of working going to be efficient? They've maybe started with something that's not not particularly high risk, it's maybe a, just a website or something like this, where they can prove the value of operating in that way. Where the, if there is a failure in the operational model, that's okay, the, the business can cope with a small outage on this. And then once they gain experience, that's when they start to usually take over more and more responsibility. So that's when someone notices, well, actually, we're seeing rapid improvements there. I wonder if they would be able to take on one part of the, uh, of the new service that we're putting in place. Or as is typical, we're re-architecting our services. And so would it be possible to host some of these other ones in lightweight uh, containers or in serverless functions and this kind of thing? Now, the downside is, of course, because there's been that rapid movement to pick things up, we do then have sometimes some sprawl that's there. You know, we do have things that are left over. Something was put in to get something to work and isn't, isn't um, useful anymore, isn't being maintained. So auditing the environment, that comes in. Now, all of these things might seem like, well, this is an awful lot of stuff that you're telling us here that we need to cope with. It's not, I mean, we talked about seven steps. It really is a case of, they all go hand in hand. So the automation that you're doing to deploy stuff, you're also then able with the abstractions that are there with cloud native and with the automation that you're doing with DevSecOps, you're able to then see all this very easily. And that of course means that you can continuously and very quickly see everything that's out there in the estate. So actually being able to go, what are the highest risks? How does this fit in? Do I care about those risks? And you know, as a security chap now from Palo Alto, um, of course you are, you, you, want to, you want to secure all the things. And perhaps you do, but also, is it important to you? If you don't have the visibility and you've got that audit sprawl, then really you're not, you're not gonna have that, um, you're not gonna be able to uh, do that without, sorry, without being able to see the visibility into it. Okay, how does Prisma Cloud do all this? Uh, it's not a sales pitch, honest, I'm just, uh, just trying to get an honest, honest wage out of everything. Um, this is really just something that I would shout out, the, the Prisma Cloud from Palo Alto Networks, which I'm very proud actually, as much as I, I disparage these types of things in, in talks like this, having a vendor I have a slide here, I do really, really like the Prisma Cloud functionality that's there. And what it is, is it's about providing all of that functionality 
in a way that's you know enterprise grade and available for you know security teams to use if you do have that segregation between ops and dev and sec it's still usable for them but equally we've got this way of fitting in with everything and so be able to say right whatever ci tool that your teams are using here they can scan whatever they need to and get that information there and then that's not something you need to create a process for um, anything that's being shipped you know if stuff's getting put into different registries this is where i um i was a customer before i came over to to work with palo alto and one of the things i very quickly realized when i was working and doing um, managing a whole uh, whole kubernetes cluster actually um, was that i didn't have the devops cycles to be able to do security as well as manage the whole infrastructure and so i was then looking at it and going well how can i do this okay i will reach out to vendors that are there to say you know my my core um, capability is running and managing this Kubernetes side of things, which I might maybe now be using a managed Kubernetes service, but back in the day, I had to run my own because I wanted to be footloose and be able to have my, um, my developers be able to run in different clouds. They just operated as containers and I shipped them wherever I needed to, to put them. But I, I very quickly realized I couldn't do the security as well. And that's where reaching out to vendor is very worthwhile. Or there are open source options that you can investigate. I felt that that was um, too much of a burden for me, but you know, do whatever you do, think about the security that's there. Okay, I, I, I saw some, I think I'll be able to find my chat there. I think I might've seen some stuff coming through. Um, I'll just say thank you just now and uh, see if there's any questions that come up. Brilliant, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I'll probably um, read out the first question, um, if that's okay with everybody here. Um, so David has asked, how are the business aligned to an increased rate of change and continuous improvement? That's a really good question, actually. So this is, this is something that usually is approached quite softly. Um, if the business isn't aligned, then it's obviously you, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have a major problem because if you've got a lot of change that's going through, somebody needs to, for, for you know, talking methodologies, someone needs to be the product owner or the equivalent of that to make sure that, Whatever is being delivered is actually the thing that the business wants. Um, but I find that businesses and the more people, especially um, now that I've, I've moved into my um, cloud CTO role, the, the level that I'm speaking at in, in companies now, I'm seeing an increased in awareness and engagement. So I've seen some um, like chief digital officers, or sometimes it's the you know like a, a head product architect or this kind of thing, who's really seeing the value, and they are then taking on the decisions in order to keep on operating that way. So I am seeing business align a lot closer with this. And I think a lot of it's, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a whole lot of things coming together at once. We've got the availability of compute, right? So it's, it's not like um, in my old back, old, back in the bad old days where it was big Sun Solaris servers and you paid lots and lots of money for one. And then the business got really upset when I told them we needed two in case it broke. And then pointed out they needed a third and a different site just because I was nasty. Um, th there's been a lot of change in the technology and the availability of that. And things moving from a CapEx um, uh, model to an OpEx model is all there. At the same time, we've seen the um, you know, traditional um, ways of working. So like uh, OODA loops and things like this aren't new, um, but they've come in at the same time. And we've seen these people changes. So the Agile Manifesto is quite old now. We've seen people then being aware of what technology can do. We've all got smartphones. We've all got um, con consumers and internal customers who actually have a better awareness of what technology can do. So I think all of these things coming together mean that businesses are a lot more aware and going through those digital transformations. I, I find that question, I could, as you can tell, I could talk for hours on that. I find that yeah. a really good one because it's one where you want to go at, and speak to the person who's doing the business side of things to go, you know, what their view is. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and now a question from um, Lee. Um, can a security product like this scan AMIs brackets in AWS VM image repository before they are deployed to running VMs? The classic, can you see inside a container question? Yeah, so well, I'll, first of all, I'll do the salesy bit and then I'll, and then I'll do the other options. Um, from a salesy point of view, yes, absolutely. Prisma Cloud will allow you to, to get that information from AMIs 
um, from and do those, you know, scan those AMIs and tell you about everything inside them before they become running VMs, before you, you deploy them. Uh, the same with images. Uh, we can give that as soon as an image is built by a developer, we can scan that there and then and allow them to do the scans and see everything that's inside of that right the way through to being a registry and all this kind of thing. And then taking my sales hat off, there are tools that can do this as well. You are able to get um, open source tools or maybe even go back a step and say, okay, well, if I'm building my AMIs, I could maybe use a tool like Packer and I could, I could scan it and as part of that build. It's a little bit more, there's more effort that you need to go to, obviously, um, but it, yeah, it's possible to do that with AMIs. I don't know off the top of my head, if you, if you got an AMI from somebody else, if there's a, there must be tools that allow you to scan it. Certainly Prisma Cloud can do that. Uh, I'm honestly, I don't, can't think of an open source one, but there, there might be one that's there. I hope that answers the question. I think so, thank you. Um, yeah, and I should probably say for sort of uh, full disclosure, um, we worked uh, as Broadlight with um, Twistlock back in the day, and uh, a lot of the good people from there have now transitioned into the Prisma Cloud Paolo Alto network world, and some of our customers are using the software to great advantage, particularly for um, uh, compliance and audit points. So, um, excellent. Um, I'll go verbal now because I think uh, that's all of the written questions. Um, who would? Who's next? Um, would anyone like to ask a question? Um, can you use role-based access control based on Azure Active Directory? Uh, yeah, with, with Prisma Cloud, you, you certainly can. You can, uh, you can make use of that. And, uh, and that you can do role-based access control for who's able to you know, look at, uh, at scans and, and group things together and do all that kind of thing. So yeah, certainly. Um, the, the Prisma Cloud product is, is actually interesting. And it's interesting you brought up the Twistlock part. So that was where I came, actually came into Palo Alto Networks from. Um, I was the first person in EMEA for, for Twistlock. So I'm quite, quite proud of that. It was quite a stressful time, but it was, it was good at the same time. Um, and uh, that was, you know, the Prisma Cloud product is made up of um, the Twistlock piece and also an, another part, another company that was acquired called PureSec, who specialized in serverless security. And that's one part. So that's if we talk Gartner terms, and that would be the cloud workload protection piece. A platform is what they say, I always have a piece at the end. Uh, and then the other part of Pisma Cloud is, of course, the bit that's for securing the cloud accounts and what's out there. So cloud security posture management part. And that's all, all wrapped up in the, in the one product, which is Prisma Cloud. And Prisma Cloud will work quite happily with, uh, with Azure. Um, I do see a written question coming in there as well, which is, why is your product better than a native WAF that comes with Amazon? Or, yeah, sure. So, you know, a, a WAF, I didn't, I've not gone into any specific, well, I've not gone into detail about what, what the product can do. Uh, and that would be a, a full a full demo that, uh, that I would be going into. From a, from, from a product point of view for that cloud workload protection, it's a lot more than just a WAF. So there's a whole load around, um, well, here's an example. If you have a very simple example, by the way, product does a lot more than just this. If you have a container that's running and it's running um, Apache, then we can put a WAF in front of it, same as a WAF as you would have. And, and if you want to choose a different WAF, that's fine. Um, it, it, it do the same thing. And you can block threats from coming to that to the uh, to that container, and it's got to be stuff that, that a WAF can filter out. But what we can do is, if someone was to exec onto that container because they had access at the cluster level, or if the Apache process or Nginx, whichever I said, if, if whatever that container is running, if that for some reason uh, then tries to run something else or write to a different area of the file system than it should, or you know anything out of the ordinary, anything out of what we've learned, it's allowed to do then that's where Prisma Cloud can actually block that behavior from happening. So absolutely, are, is our WAF better than, a, than one of the other WAFs? <sighs> Arguable. I, I could quite happily speak to someone who would say, no, I would rather use Azure's web application firewall. Great, fight, fill your boots, no problem there. But Azure web application firewall or any of the cloud providers um, security tooling isn't going to be able to do that protection for uh, the, the running container and what it does. And especially not, if that running container is running on VMware uh, on a server in your data center, whereas we'll cover all of those pieces. I hope that, uh -huh. Michael, I hope that answered your question. 
Thank you, Ashley. Um, I, I would like to point out for the record, we are not a Paolo Alto reseller, by the way. Uh, so um, we, we just uh, use them in production. So um, sadly, you can't buy it from Broad Light. But um, OK, I believe uh, I got a private message. Um, uh, Natalia, I think you've got a question. Yes, thank you, Rob. Uh, Ashley, thank you for the present presentation. So yeah, my question is, uh, how is Paul Alto's product offering going to be improved uh, comparing with uh, Twistlock? Yeah, so since um, it was actually, let me think, let me tell, so I tell the truth. It was July last year when Twistlock was acquired by Paul Alto Networks. It was November last year when uh, the Twistlock product became part of the Prisma Cloud uh, full suite. And since then, we've had another two releases of what was Twistlock. It's now um, just for fun being called Prisma Cloud Compute. We've had another two functional releases from that. Uh, and the product teams are, are still all working quite well. The great thing about these acquisitions is that it's not been, you know, acquire the technology and lay off all the staff. It, it, quite the opposite is actually been we acquire the company and the developers and everyone are still there and still running. So uh, John Morello, the CTO of um, Twistlock, who you might know is the uh, co-author of the NIST special publication 80190 in container security. A good read, by the way, if you do look at container stuff. Um, he's not my boss anymore, so I don't even need to say that as a, uh, a brown nosy attempt. And no, it is a good read because it's, it's all about that. But my point being to that question, we, have, we are still committed to developing the Twistlock part of Prisma Cloud. And we still have a huge number of customers who operate solely in their own data center. And so that really is just the Twistlock piece. So yeah, the Twistlock technology as part of Prisma Cloud isn't going anywhere soon. It's still really important to us. Natalia, does, does that answer the question or, or did you need more? No, no, that's absolutely funny. You answer all my question. Thank you. Excellent. Um, my email is on the screen there. Sorry, before Rob, before you keep going. I, the, my email is on the screen there, please. Um, I have that lovely award at paloautonetworks.com. Please reach out to me if there's anything. Um, I, I'm always happy to chat uh, and always happy to take any questions after this. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ashley, from everybody present. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Probably, sorry, I've got to sorry, ask one you. more. Go on, yeah. one more. All right, Rob. Sorry, I've got to ask Ashley. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's Michael here. Um, is your solution available in the Amazon marketplace natively, or is it just a standalone product? Because I found it really interesting today what you've demonstrated. Well, that's, I'll definitely need to buy you that round back again. There's a, one, a beer before we started this, and now this kind of, oh, brilliant. And, no, um, and just to be clear, that was a joke from the beginning of the, uh, the, this webinar. It wasn't, uh, no, no alcohol has been consumed. Um, the, the, <laughs> it is absolutely, if you go to the marketplace, uh, you can get it there. If you, um, I think we still have a free trial available. We might not anymore, but yes, it's certainly there, and, and you can buy through that as well, should anyone wish to, wish to purchase. Um, but yeah, please do go, go and have a look. And, and thank you for the kind words about the, uh, the presentation. Brilliant. Okay, I think we'll um, I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you ever so much, Ashley, for your um, kind presentation. Um, and also thank you to Jade for arranging this from Broadlight. And thank you to Brandon, who uh, we've known for several years, who's uh, come along to have a look. And um, if anyone has any further questions, please do ask in the bunker. But otherwise, we'll, we'll draw this one to a close and we will provide the video in a couple of days. So um, thank you very much, everybody.